Turn your Bibles with me now, if you would, to 1 Samuel chapter 30. 1 Samuel chapter 30. Before we get to 1 Samuel chapter 30, I'm just going to kind of give a little bit of an overview of where we're at in the story of David. Uh, chapter 22, 1 Samuel. Uh, David departs into Adullam. Um, the priests of Nob there were slain. So we see here, David uh, departs after he finds out, and we talked about this uh, way back in the uh, foundations of this group here, um, at least my involvement, uh, that he had just found out about, about Jonathan and that, that deal that they had made where they were going to shoot the arrow and figure out whether or not David should uh, stay or whether or not David should depart. And we find out he does depart onto Adullam, which is a cave, whereby he can hide away from Saul until things pass over, so it seems. Uh, chapter 23, uh, he defends Keilah against the Philistines. Um, after that, he goes and he hides in strongholds. Saul continually, secretly practicing mischief against David, um, in, intenting to, to find him, track him down, contain him, and eventually kill him. But David, again, he's still helping people. He's still fighting against the Philistines. He's still doing what he intended to do. All the while, Saul is practicing mischief against him. Chapter 22, he cuts Saul's robe for the first time. We see privily in mercy, he's standing over Saul as he's sleeping. And he, instead of killing the man who's trying to kill him, David, out of mercy, thinks, well, why should I destroy the Lord's anointed? And only cuts a small part of uh, Saul's robe off privily um, and in the exchange that they had that ensued uh, Saul actually repents here and he and he says you know what David I'm sorry I'm sorry that I've come at you um, and that's uh, the exchange that they had in chapter 25 Samuel dies and there's a great mourning that ensues uh, the people for many days spent just mourning over the death of Samuel David here overcomes Nabal, and it's only through a miracle. David didn't even have to raise a sword against him, but rather Nabal's wife actually pleaded with David not to raise the sword against him, and God smote the man Nabal. His heart turned stone, and he died within 10 days after the Lord smiting him. This time David claims Nabal's wife, and obviously we know he claimed another one at a time. We do know that David had a first wife, she was also given away by Saul. Chapter 26, um, he spares Saul's life for the second time. And again, for the second time, Saul repents and says he admits his fault. He was wrong. He didn't mean to. You know, he's, he's coming at him for the wrong reasons. And, and uh, David, my son, my son, he cries out and, and hopes that uh, David will, you know, he does not repent at this time, but we actually see him admitting at least that he is a, a sinner in this situation. David in chapter 27 is, is, is starting to catch on. He realizes that he's going to be slain in this land if he was to stay in this land. And in 1 Samuel chapter 27 and verse 6, the Bible says, And Achish gave him Ziklag that day, wherefore Ziklag pertaineth unto the kings of Judah to this day. So David was able to walk into a foreign army, into the land of Gath, which is uh, a portion of the Philistines' land. And he was, he was offered grace before the ruler, before the leader, uh, Achish, at that time. And uh, he actually received Ziklag, a town for himself, and that even pertaineth unto the kings of Judah up until this day that 1 Samuel was penned. In verse 12, this is reiterated, Achish believed David, saying, He hath made his people Israel utterly to abhor him, Therefore, he shall be my servant forever. So I, I guess it, his, his rationale as to why he would let a foreign king or a foreign would-be king into him was that, well, he, he, already, he already stinketh. He's abhorrent unto his own people. So, so he can come here and he can be my servant forever. In, verse, in chapter 28, Saul consults the witch at Endor. We all know that story. In chapter 29, we, we find out Achish um, told by the other lords of the Philistines that there is, in fact, a conflict of interest here. And in, in the course of action, he actually turns away David. Uh, 1 Samuel 29, beginning in verse 7, the Bible says, Wherefore now return and go in peace, that thou displease not 
the lords of the Philistines. It seems that this, this agreement had, that had been made uh, displeased the other lords of the Philistines. And David said unto Achish, But what have I done? And what hast thou found in thy servant, so long as I have been with thee unto this day, that I may not go and fight against the enemies of the Lord the king? And Achish answered and said to David, I know that thou art good in my sight, as an angel of God, notwithstanding the princes of the Philistines have said, he shall not go up to battle with us. And in verse 11, so David and his men rose up early to depart in the morning to the land of of the Philistines. So in other words, he's just continually not going to set foot where he, where he was given by Achish, but rather he's turned away, he's not going to go to battle with them, and he retreats essentially from the armies of Achish into the land of Philistines. And this brings us to 1 Samuel chapter 30. 1 Samuel chapter 30. So we find here a very discouraged David. We find David was a servant of Saul, and then Saul turns on him. We find David as a servant to Samuel, and then Samuel dies. We find David a servant of Achish of Gath, and then Achish of Gath is given, given doubting from his supporters, from his, his group, from his friends. And in doing so, he says, David, we can't, we can't be a team. We can't work together. You have to depart. And what I want to talk about, the title of this message is, David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. David encouraged himself in the Lord his God, despite his discouragement. 1 Samuel chapter 30, the Bible reads, And it came to pass when David and his men were come to Ziklag on the third day that the Amalekites had invaded the south and Ziklag and, and, Ziklag, and had smitten Ziklag and burned it with fire and had taken the women captives that were therein. They slew not any, either great or small, but carried them away and went on their way. So David and his men came to the city, and behold, it was burned with fire, and their wives and their sons and their daughters were taken captives. Then David and the people that were there, that were with them, lifted up their voice and wept until they had no more power to weep. And David's two wives were taken captive, Ahinoam the Jezreelitess, and Abigail, the wife of Nabal, the Carmelite. And David was greatly distressed. For the people spake of stoning him, because the soul of all the people was grieved. Every man for his sons and for his daughters, but David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. And David said to Abiathar the priest, Ahimelech's son, I pray thee, bring me hither the ephod. And Abiathar brought thither the ephod to David. And David inquired at the Lord, saying, Shall I pursue after this troop? Shall I overcome them? And he answered him, Pursue, for thou shalt surely overtake them, and without fail recover all. So David went, he and the six hundred men that were with him, and came to the brook Besor, and those that were left behind stayed. But David pursued, he and the four hundred men, for two hundred abode behind, which were so faint that they could not go over the brook Besor. And they found an Egyptian in the field, and brought him to David, and gave him bread, and he did eat, and they made him drink water. And they gave him a piece of a cake of figs, and two clusters of raisins, and when he had eaten, his spirit came again to him, and he had eaten no bread, nor drunk any water three days and three nights. And David said unto him, To whom belongest thou, and whence art thou? And he said, I am a young man of Egypt, servant to an Amalekite. And my master left me because three days agone I fell sick. We made an invasion upon the south of the Cherethites and upon the coast which belongeth to Judah and upon the south of Caleb. And we burned Ziklag with fire. And David said unto him, Canst thou bring me down to this company? And he said, Swear unto me by God that thou wilt neither kill me nor deliver me into the hands of my master and I will bring thee down to this company. And when he had brought him down, behold, they were spread abroad upon all the earth, eating and drinking and dancing, because of all the great spoil that they had taken out of the land of the Philistines and out of the land of Judah. And David smote them from the twilight, even unto the evening of the next day. And there escaped not a man of them, save four hundred young men, which rode upon camels and fled. And David recovered all that the Amalekites had carried away. And David rescued his two wives, 
and there was nothing lacking to them, neither small nor great, neither sons nor daughters, neither spoil nor anything that they had taken to them. David recovered all. And David took all the flocks and the herds, which they drove, drave before those other cattle, and said, This is David's spoil. And David came to the two hundred men which were so faint that they could not follow David, whom they had made also to abide at the brook Besor. And they went forth to meet David, and to meet the people that were with him. And when David came near to the people, he saluted them, and answered all the wicked men, and the men of Belial, of those that went with David, and said, Because they went not with us, we will not give them aught of the spoil that we have recovered. Save to every man his wife and his children, that they may lead them away and depart. Then said David, Ye shall not do so, my brethren, with that which the Lord hath given us, who hath preserved us, and delivered the company that came against us into our hand. For who will hearken unto you in this matter? But as his part is that goeth down to the battle, so shall his part be that tarrieth by the stuff. They shall part alike. And it was so from that day forward that he made it a statute and an ordinance, ordinance for Israel unto this day. And when David came to Ziklag, he sent of the spoil unto the elders of Judah, even to his friends, saying, Behold a present for you of the spoil of the enemies of the Lord, to them which were in Bethel, and to them which were in, in South Ramoth, and to them which were in Jatir, and to them which were in Aror, and to them which were in Sifmoth, and to them which were in Eshtemoah, and to them which were in Rachel, and to them which were in the cities of the Jeramelites, and to them which were in the cities of the Kenites, and to them which were in Hormah, and to them which were in Korashan, and to them which were in Athach, and to them which were in Hebron, and to the princes where David himself and his men want to hunt. I thank you, Lord God, for this day and for your scriptures. I pray, God, that you would just give me spirit, give me wisdom and understanding in uh, expounding them. I pray, God, that you would give us a message, Lord, that we need to hear, something practical that we can apply to our daily lives, that we may grow thereby. And I thank you for your goodness and for your love, and for sending your Son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for our sins. And I thank you that they are all paid in full, thanks to his worthy sacrifice. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. First Samuel, in verse 30, verse 1 to 2, we see that these were slew, but they weren't taken. It says, and had taken women captives that were therein. They slew not any, either small or great, but carried away and went on their way. And I think sometimes, I, I don't know how this situation would pertain um, unto David particularly, but sometimes sometimes closure seems, seems better. I was just thinking about this situation. How hard it would be to go through all David's going through, but then to lose his wife and his children, and to lose the wives and the children of those that he was leading, and just that, that great loss that was there. But I, wa I wonder if it, if it was harder having lost them and them taken away captive, or, or if it, it would have been harder having lost them and actually lost them as if they were killed. I think sometimes, sometimes, yeah, we do see that there would be hope if they were still living, but we also see, we know, you know, because even in the story of, of uh, Saul, he, he fell upon his knife because he had great fear of what the Philistines would do unto me. So the worry, of course, would be there that, that these Philistines, this Philistine group, um, sorry, of Amalekites, that they would have taken them and done worse to them and slew them, in fact. But regardless, the story tells that they were, they were not slain, but they were taken. In verse 3, the Bible says, So David and his men came to the city, and behold, it was burned with fire. Their wives and their sons and their daughters were taken captive. And yeah, there is this great tumult. There's this great worry. There's this great sickness that comes upon the people because of their great loss and their great mourning. All these things have happened. They thought they were going to go to battle. They thought that that, that land of Ziklag was actually protected because they had an allegiance with the king of that area. But that was cut off. The Amalekites moved in. Perhaps at the same time that the armies moved out, we're not going to support David and his group anymore. And they take the city, burn it with fire. The wives, the sons, and their daughters are all taken away captive. At this point, what is there left to do? Well, the people, they rose their voices. They lift up their voices, and they begin to weep. 
And they wept such that they wept until they had no more power to weep. I don't know if you've ever been there, but I mean, th this is such a great loss. And, and I can think of maybe a couple of situations in my life where it was just like the wind was just taken out of you and there's nothing you could do but just, just weep until there was no power. I've, I've been there. I can think of one specific location, one specific time, one specific moment in my Christian walk where there were literally no more tears left. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a crazy end when you're, you're wondering. There's nothing left to do. There's no more power even to weep. They just found themselves devastated and mourning and crushed beneath the weight of all that had just happened. In verse 5, David's two wives were taken captives, Ahinoam and the Jezreelites and Abigail, the wife of Nabal, the Carmelite. And so David here in verse 6, having lost again his wives, having lost his sons and his daughters, having them taken away captive, having lost the city, the allegiance, the, the, the fellowship that he thought he once had, having lost his status within the, the kingdom, having lost everything, there's nothing left but to weep. David was indeed greatly distressed. And, and we see here so much the so that, that David was distressed, the people took it even harder. We find the people here grieved to the point where their soul of their people was so grieved, every man and their sons and their daughters and the loss that they had, that they actually spake of stoning David. They spake of stoning their leader just to put away the grief from them. This wouldn't have helped. This wouldn't have healed them at all or, or brought back their loss. But these people had just wept until there was no power to weep and, and distressed now, grieved now. They talk about stoning their leader. But David, here it is, David encouraged himself in the Lord. So the people were grieved and talk of stoning the leader. But David, though distressed, encourages himself in the Lord his God. There's no encouragement here for David from the people. There's no encouragement from his possessions. There's no encouragement from his wife, from his children, from his friends, from his allies. There's no encouragement left for David at this time. But in the Lord his God. Have you ever been there? Alone and yet encouraged. Alone and yet built up. Why? Because you have the Lord God. And that's just a, a great and wonderful statement that when you have nothing, you have the Lord. I mean, you could have all of the riches of this world, all the comforts, all of the support, all of the help, all of the love of this world, and still be encouraged. Why? Because you have the Lord to encourage yourself in. So I just want to talk about some of the ways which David encouraged himself in the Lord. We find many of them within this passage. David encouraged himself in the Lord. The first is that David, as the psalmist, would have encouraged himself in the Lord through psalm. We know this to be the case very often times in the psalms. David would actually sing songs about losses, sing songs about lo loss of victory, sing songs about mourning, about death, about struggles. He would, he would sing these great hymns, these great psalms, and he would do that, I believe, to encourage himself. The Bible says that we're to speak to ourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in our hearts to the Lord. And that's in Ephesians 5.19. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 16 says, Similarly, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatsoever ye do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. And that's, I believe, what singing unto God gives us in our hearts. It gives us a thankful heart. It gives us an appreciation for the Lord God. And when we let the word of Christ dwell in us, through songs it's even better because now these psalms, these hymns, these spiritual songs have substance to them. I know that the psalms are entirely scripture, but would to God we would take those hymns in our hymn book, we would take those spiritual tunes, those spiritual melodies, those, those songs, and use them to nourish our hearts and get us onto the thankful wavelength with God, the appreciative wavelength with God, where we are lifting up Christ richly and in all wisdom, teaching one another through them and allowing our hearts to be filled with grace and to grow thereby. The first point that I believe David resorted to to encourage himself was to sing psalms. 
Yes, we have Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. And many of us have memorized that psalm and used that to comfort ourselves in times. But we don't also, we don't have the music for these. So we can read psalms, but in, until recently, I haven't heard too many people actually taking the psalms and putting them to music. I've done that a little bit on my own time, but we don't have the notes actually lined out. It is a song book, but it's not orchestrated in the same way for us. So what do we resort to? Yes, David probably grabbed his, his instrument of ten strings, and he would have played, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Perhaps that was one of the first psalms that he ever wrote as he was just a shepherd boy out there, and his only job was to mind the flock. He said, The, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, or whatever the tune was to it. But today we have these. We have our hymn books. Every one of us should have or get a copy, and we'll make sure that we do that for everyone going forward. We can sing, To God be the glory, great things He hath done, so loved He the world that He gave us His Son. Look to the Lamb of God, look to the Lamb of God. For he alone is able to save you. Look to the Lamb of God. Are you weary? Does the way seem long? Look to the Lamb of God. His love will cheer and fill your heart with song. Look to the Lamb of God. What about when upon life's billows you are tempest-tossed? When you are discouraged thinking all is lost? Count your many blessings, name them one by one, and it will surprise you what the Lord hath done. Oh, what a wonderful Savior is Jesus, my Jesus. What a wonderful Savior is Jesus, my Lord. And we can go on and on and on and just encourage ourselves in songs. Throughout the day, just, just, just bring that with you. If you forget the songs, if you forget the, tip, the hymns, just, just bring, a, bring a player, bring, bring something. Just find an opportunity, find a time. You know, I remember so long ago hearing from, from Christians that there was, they had a song in their heart. When they were saved, they had a song in their heart. And I was like, what in the world are they talking about? God put a new song in my heart when I was saved. And I didn't have that. But then one day I distinctly remember saying like, God, when I wake up tomorrow, put that new song in my heart. And then I, I woke up that next day and I said, There's within my heart a melody. Jesus whispers sweet and low. And it just kept going and going and going. And honestly, almost every day I wake up with a new song in my heart. As if the Lord is just playing on repeat the great hymns of the faith. Yeah, not all of them are completely biblically sound. And one day I'd like to go through all of them and sort them all out and, and, and correct them with a fine pen or, or something like that. But those hymns, those songs can give you great encouragement in times when you just, when you just have nothing else. Times when you just have distress upon distress. You're weeping. Those songs can encourage your heart. And I believe David turned to the songs the hymns and the spiritual songs. At this time, though it doesn't say it specifically, I just think that that would have been the first thing that a man like David would turn to. He would just sing. He would just praise God. And he would just, he would just lean on that. How else would David encourage himself in the Lord? The next, number two. So encourage yourself in the Lord by speaking to yourselves in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Number two, seek godly fellowship. Look at verse seven. And David said unto Abiathar the priest, Ahimelech's son, I pray thee, bring me hither the ephod. So the first thing that David does after he encourages himself, I mean, he just went through all of this, and now the people are going to stone him with stones. He goes to the priest, and he says to the priest, bring me the resources for my spiritual need. Bring me resources whereby I can get a hold of God. Bring me something that will help me spiritually, not necessarily physically, but he says, Bring me the ephod. And Abiathar, as a good friend, as a good leader, brought thither the ephod unto David. He brings him what he needs. It was because David sought out that godly fellowship. Next thing you got to do in verse 3, or sorry, next point is number 3, pray. Pray. And David, after receiving that ephod, in verse 8 it says, David inquired at the Lord, saying, so he seeks godly fellowship. He seeks 
from, for somebody to help him to get to the point where he needs to be, to, to have provision that he could seek God, that he could pray to God. David inquired at the Lord. Ephesians chapter 6 says, Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching there too with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Praying always. 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 17 says, Pray without ceasing. James chapter 5 says, The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. James chapter 4 says, Ye have not because ye ask not. And when we're wondering, when we're doubting, when we're hurt, when we're down, when we're distressed, we need to get a hold of God. We need to pray unto the Lord without ceasing, and he will avail much through that prayer. You have not because he asks not. The Bible is clear. John chapter 14 says, John chapter 14, John chapter 14 and down in verse 25, These things have I spoken unto you, being yet present with you, but the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father shall send in my name, he shall teach of you all things, and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. So we're to pray, but this gives us a segue into our next point, is to now stand on the remember promises. So we know that when we're praying, that's the one-way communication with God. We're seeking God. We're saying, God, I have this need. Lord, I am deficient. Lord, I am wanting. Lord, help me through this situation. Lord, guide me. But the, the reverse of that, the communication back is God through the mission of the comforter and that he will teach you all things and bring all things into remembrance. That's what God does. That's God, how God answers our prayer in regard to motivating us, in regard to encouraging us in himself. So sing psalms, seek godly fellowship, pray and now stand on these remembered promises. Remember, God, the Holy Spirit, is going to teach you all things, yes, but then he's going to bring all these things into your remembrance. Stand on these promises. Verse 27, it says, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth give I unto you, let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be, af neither let it be afraid. Our peace comes from knowing the remembered all things that the Holy Spirit provides for us. So when you have scriptures that you've read, scriptures that you've studied out, scriptures that you've understood, and then you seek God in prayer, He gives you back those promises that you can stand on. The, the things that I fear, I don't have to fear. Why? Because God says that simple statement, fear not, neither be ye troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. You say, God, I feel like you're not close. I feel like you've left me. I feel like I have nothing. And God says, I will not leave thee, nor forsake thee. You say, God, I'm going through so much trouble, so much tribulation. Everyone seems to be attacking me. I've lost it all. I'm in trouble, God. I need your help. And he says, in the world you shall have tribulation. Be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Lord, I don't know where I need to go next. Lord, I'm trying to understand what direction I need to take. I need provision. I need something to lead me. I need something to guide me. I need to know what my next step should be. And he says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. And you say, God, you know what? I sometimes feel like you just don't care. Lord, I'm wondering, I'm worrying, I'm, I'm struggling. It seems like everybody around me is going through uh, great things, great successes. There's no trouble in their lives. And, and, and Lord, I just feel like I'm of no value to this world. I feel like I'm of no value unto you, Lord. And he says, you are more of more value than many sparrows. And talking with about the provision and talking how they toil not, they don't, they don't seek their food, he feeds them. In the same way as, as, as the plant grows up, right? It spoils another spin, but God provides the nourishment. God provides for the sparrows, and he says, it's, a, it's just a bird. Be, be of good cheer. You have more value than many sparrows. And God, the Holy Spirit, will bring to you these great encouragements. When you first pray unto him and say, God, here's where I lack, here's what I need, I can't do it my own. He says, hey, remember this scripture brings it into remembrance, and your 
responsibility now is to just stand on those promises of God. Romans chapter 8 and verse 31, one of our greatest little portions of scripture for just encouragement in the Christian life says, What shall we say then to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. <clears throat> who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep to the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded, are you persuaded today, Christian, of these promises? I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor death, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Great and wonderful promises. That scripture, I mean, how often have you been in, in trouble and in dire straits and wondering and, and, and just thinking upon things and wondering, hey, everyone seems to be against us. Well, if God be for us, who can be against us? Oh, God, these people are charging me of these great things. Well, who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It's God that justifieth. Uh, they're condemning me, Lord. They're putting me down as if I'm, if I'm mud and I'm dirt. Christ died for you, yea, rather is risen again. You're paid for. And look at this. He maketh intercession. He ever liveth to make intercession for us. The love of God is something in which we will never be separated from. And it's not because of my goodness. It's because he promised it so. And we can stand on that. We can stand on these promises. The first point is that David, as the psalmist, was speaking to himself in psalm and hymn and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in his heart to the Lord. The second point is that he sought godly fellowship. Next, he prayed unto the Lord. And then when the Lord answered him with these great and precious promises, he stood on them. He remembered those promises, and he allowed those to encourage him in the Lord. David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. The next point, don't give up the fight. Back in 1 Samuel chapter 30, don't give up the fight. And David inquired at the Lord, saying, Shall I pursue after this troop? Shall I overtake them? And he answered him, Pursue. For thou shalt surely overtake them, and without fail recover all. There's a great promise for David. So David went, he and the 600 men that were with him, and came to the brook Besar, where those that were left behind stayed. So there's a group here, and I will, I will point this out, that that there's a group of those that could not go. And it says in verse 10, David pursued he and 400 men for 200 abode behind, which were so faint that they could not go over the brook Besor. And there, there was me about, about five years ago when I, I, was, I was so faint, lying in my driveway, just defeated, just, just, just not even able to breathe for the, the tribulation that had overtaken me. And, and I could only speak to myself in Psalms. I could only seek after perhaps that godly fellowship. I could pray and I could stand on the promises, those few promises that I have. But to go out and to fight, there was just no strength in me. To go out and to battle, there was nothing that I could do. I was so faint that I couldn't even cross over the brook, Besor. I couldn't even get into the place where the fight was happening. But there is those, we see, that, that two-thirds of them were able to not give up the fight. Yes, some were so faint that perhaps it was only the first four steps of encouraging themselves in the Lord that they could take part of. But for those that could, for those that were willing, they were encouraged. Now, as a Christian, we're not going out and fighting these great, these great battles with swords and with spears and with weapons um, that are carnal, right? But we wrestle not against flesh and blood, we wrestle against 
principalities, against powers, against the rules of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. So our getting involved in the fight, our getting involved in the battle of the Lord's army, is just like we already talked about today briefly, is that we would go out as, as light among this world. We would go out and we would preach the gospel. Our ministry is that of reconciliation. So yeah, go out and join the fight towards your co-workers. Fight those spiritual battles against the things that they're trying to incorporate in the workplace. Things that they're trying to force on you. Things that they're trying to make you believe. Things that they're mocking you for. Go out and fight against the unjust authorities. Go out and, and speak your mind against those that would, would, would wrongfully put someone down. We just saw that, that event in the South about the soul winner that got thrown down and thrown into prison and all that. Speak against that. Fight against that. Make your voice known in those situations. <laughs> Fight against those situations where people try to tell you not to do right by God by simply obeying God rather than men. We're also supposed to join the fight against false prophets. We're supposed to speak out where doctrine is wrong. We're supposed to speak our minds. We're supposed to speak the word of truth and shine light in dark places. Don't give up the fight, Christian. I believe that David stayed in the fight. That's one way he was able to encourage himself in the Lord. He was able to move forward doing righteously before God. The next is verse 6, or the uh, next point is number 6. Help someone out. Look at verse 11. And they found an Egyptian in the field and brought him to David and gave him bread, and he did eat, and they made him drink water. I've heard it said, uh, uh, a quote that Jack Howells used to say. He always used to say, be good to everybody. Everybody is having a tough time. Be good to everybody. Everybody is having a tough time. And one way to encourage yourself is to help somebody else out. Do something good for somebody else. It will encourage you because if you do it selflessly, you're actually strengthened thereby. God will, yeah, give you rewards in heaven for doing, doing indiscriminate, r righteous, good things to people um, just out of the kindness of your heart. But it'll also strengthen you. It'll warm your heart. It'll, it'll, it'll be good for you to see someone else encouraged by your actions. Look at verse 12. And they gave him a piece of a cake of figs and two clusters of raisins. And when he had eaten, his spirit came again to him, for he had eaten no bread nor drunk any water three days and three nights. And David said unto him, To whom belongest thou? So like I said, they did right to him. They helped him out, and they did it indiscriminately. It took until verse 13 where he finally says, uh, Who are you? No, they saw a man that was hurting. They saw a man that was hungry. They, they saw a man that was thirsty, and they didn't say, well, where do you stand on this doctrine? What do you believe about this? No, no, they just, they just helped the man out. They didn't, they didn't wait to find out who he worked for, or who he fought with, or where he was from. They just indiscriminately helped him out. And look at the thing that is given to him. Look what's given to him. In verse 11, the Bible says, bread and he did eat they gave him bread and he did eat john chapter 6 and verse 35 says i am the bread of life he that cometh to me shall never hunger and they made him drink water again in verse 11 whoso drinketh of this water john 4 says shall never thirst everlasting life i believe these are just typology pictures but they took this man in without caring about who he was what he believed, where he was from, what he thought about this political stance or where he was in that. Indiscriminately, they, they took the man and they gave him bread. They took the man and they gave him a drink of water. The next point after helping someone out is go soul winning. I believe that's just a picture of what they did for this man. They took a man who they knew nothing about and they said to him, and they, and they, and they said to him, here, take of this bread and eat. Here, take of this water and drink. They offered him that bread of life, if you will. They offered him that living water, if you will. I believe that when we go soul winning, especially when we're defeated, especially when we're depressed, we're down, we're, we're not feeling right, we're not feeling into it, we're, we're, we're just, we're sick, we're, we're sad, we're, we're perhaps weeping when there's no power to weep. I feel that when we go soul winning, and we knock on that door, and we see that person on the other side of the door, and we tell them about Jesus, we have now shifted our perspective from a, a me, 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 me perspective, which you'll get when you're just down, when there's no power but to weep, when you're just mourning, when you're just hurting, when you're just in your own sadness, you'll just dwell there. But if you take away the me, me, me 
and go and help to set someone free. Go to preach somebody righteousness. Go to preach to somebody the true gospel, the, the way, the living way unto heaven. You've now taken your focus from me and you've given it upon somebody else. You're going to focus on Christ. You're going to focus on that person and help them to be reconciled unto Christ through the preaching of the gospel. And that's the best way, one of the best ways to take that sadness upon yourself, to encourage yourself in the Lord is to go so in it. Remove the focus from self and put your focus on somebody else, on Christ, that you could bring them together, you could reconcile them. Just serve as that mediator that simply says, lost sinner, meet the Savior. And just talk it out until they come to know one another, until they can be reconciled unto the Father, until Christ can bring them unto the Father. Now in verse 14 through 15, we see uh, the, the locations revealed to them. In verse 16 through 17, we see that that great army is defeated. And then in verse 18 through 20, and David recovered all. So there's that promise coming to full fruition. David recovered all that the Amalekites had carried away. And David rescued his two wives. So he recovered all. We see that he, he, he was not lacking of anything that had been taken from him. There was nothing lacking to him, small nor great, sons nor daughters, neither spoil nor anything that they had taken to them. David recovered all, and he took all the flocks and the herds, which they drave before those other cattle, and said, this is David's spoil. David's spoil wasn't, wasn't bigger than what he had started with, and that's a great thing. David didn't go out into this great battle and hope to attain more. His great spoil was that he received back what God promised. But then look, David actually received more. He took of all of theirs according to what God provided. He wasn't lacking of what he had lost, but he received more abundantly, including what he had lost. So we see in uh, the, the, the top points here is that to encourage ourselves in the Lord, we need to sing. Sing and make melody in our hearts. We need to seek godly fellowship. We need to pray. We need to stand on the promises that we do receive through prayer and reading of the scriptures. We need to stay in the fight. We need to help somebody out. And we need to go soul winning. We need to recover souls. We need to help people out and allow God to work through our lives in that capacity. Now, we do see that not everybody took part in this fight. We do see that not everybody went out and recovered of the spoil. But... Look at this next portion, verse 21. It says, And David came to, to the 200 men, which were so faint that they could not follow David, whom they had made also to abide at the brook Besor. And they went forth to meet David and to meet the people that were with him. And when David came near to the people, he saluted them. Then answered all the wicked men, the men of Belial, of those that went with David, and said, Because they went not with us, we will not give them aught of the spoil that we have recovered. Save to every man his wife and his children, that they may lead them away and depart. So look at what the wicked people answered. Yeah, they went to the fight. Yeah, they recovered what was theirs. And upon and on top of that, much spoil. But the response, the answer of David, the answer of God, is that, as it says in verse 24... For who will hearken unto you in this matter? David speaking unto the men of Belial, the men of Satan. But as his part is that goeth down to the battle, so shall his part be that tarrieth by the stuff. They shall part alike. Every one shall part alike. Whether you goeth down or whether you tarry by the stuff. And it's a wicked attitude to say that, well, because these didn't go to battle, because these didn't perform the fight, because these didn't go out and, and fight with the armies, they shouldn't actually receive of the spoil. Now, and I believe that, and I apply that to this group here. Some people, um, but by reason of, of, of what have you, I mean, there, there are a million different reasons. Some people do not have the strength to go out to battle. Maybe we have people in here in this auditorium that, that speaking to themselves in psalms and hymns, seeking godly fellowship, Praying and standing on God's promise in the Christian life is, is, is all that they can do. They just don't have strength to cross that river, Besor. Maybe they're not grown enough. 
Maybe they're not strong enough at this time in their Christian life. Maybe they are just so sad. Maybe they're just so downtrodden. Maybe they're just in a low point where they're defeated. Things aren't going right. We are not, as a church, going to be like the men of Belial and say, well, they shouldn't take of the spoil. Amen. Now, when we go to fight, when we go to battle, whether you're strong, willing, and able, and you go out and you actually lead that person to Christ, whether you go out and you do a great mighty work for God, I believe that these shall part alike, whether you go without or whether you tarry by the stuff. I don't want an attitude in this group, in this congregation, where we start to think less of people who aren't soul winning. We start to think less of people who aren't reading their Bibles as much. We start to think less of people who uh, are, are just nervous and anxious, who are, who are in a job maybe they, they shouldn't be, where their, where their boss asks them to do things that are contrary to the Word of God sometimes, blending that line. We don't want to be in a position where we take those people who we think, who we perceive, are not living up to some sort of Christian standard, and we essentially say, that well, they have no part in this. We're not going to ain't disclude people. We're not going to put people down. We're not going to beat people up. We're not going to browbeat people. We're not going to be like these men of Belial who say, well, these people go and fight with us. Therefore, they have no part with us. They're not going to get the rewards. They're not going to get the benefits. This is why when we collect numbers for soul winning, this is why when we collect numbers for offerings, for, for whatever we do in among here where we're just keeping statistics, we don't think of somebody else's contribution to be less. Because I believe that, hey, if a Christian can listen to, this, listen to the hymns, sing hymns, have godly music in their lives, and just encourage themselves in the psalms, encourage themselves in music, if that Christian can <coughs> seek after godly fellowship, they're doing their best to be in church, they're trying <coughs> to reach out to people through the, through the phone or, or, or through many <coughs> letters or however it is, seeking fellowship and back and forth and encouragement one to another. If that person is praying, if that person is, is reading the Bible, he's somewhat taking promises and applying them to their lives, I am so happy, I am so happy to encourage that person and help them through that walk. Not everybody has to get into the fight. Not everybody has to go and always be seeking to help somebody else. Some people just don't have the means to provide water and bread, you know, uh, spiritually speaking, or, or even carnally speaking. It, it, it's sometimes not in somebody's personality, not in someone's ability to do that. Soul winning. Soul winning is, is very important, but we, we know that even within the movement, there are it's not one of the, the blacklists, you can't go to that church because there's no soul winning, right? Soul winning is, is very important, but I think, I think soul winning with the right heart and the right attitude is, is immensely more important. Amen. I think too often among this, this group, I think too often among these people that we would fellowship with and we love and we encourage and, and, and people that we would, we would think of as friends, too often soul winning becomes an act that's, that's an actual, it's just a show. It's an outward show of the flesh. When you're soul winning in the flesh, you're not reaping rewards in heaven. I'm sorry. You're just, you're acting out what you think should be done, and you're doing it from a heart that just wants to satisfy and gratify yourself. You want to show off. You want to be the big man. You want to have the big numbers. And how often have we seen the men with the big numbers end up being the men that turn out to be false prophet reprobates, right? You're not more righteous because you do, but I think it's even more important that somebody would have the right attitude in these things. And therefore, as a church, I'm not going to withhold recognition. I'm not going to withhold reward. I'm not really going to withhold encouragement or fellowship with somebody who's, yeah, not going to fight. Who's someone who's, who's having trouble helping others. Who's someone who's, who's not comfortable. Maybe they're just not comfortable trained up in soul winning and how to present the gospel. We're not going to just put somebody out and say, you know what, you know what, you have no part in this. So whatever we reap from God, whatever rewards we get, it's because of how awesome we are. No, we need to encourage one another. We need to strengthen one another. And every man shall part alike. So there we see, until you can't, when you're weeping, until you can't weep anymore, when you're hurt, when you're in distress, this isn't the time amongst ourselves to start throwing stones at one another, as the people did to David, as the people did to their leadership, as the people did to their friends. They started to want to cast stones. But rather, we need to encourage ourselves in the Lord. We need to sing. We need to make melody in our hearts. We need to seek godly fellowship. We need to pray. We need to stand on the promises that we receive. We need to fight if we're able. 
We need to help somebody out if we're able. We need to go soul winning if we're able. We need to be encouraged in the Lord. And when we do so, we need to part it all alike. We need to look at it as a congregation that succeeded. Hey, if all of us are able to get out and just have a big event, go soul winning, do great works, help out some sick folks, help out some people at a nursing home, we do that all together, that's great. But if one week happens where only Brother Rob can go out and do that, let's rejoice as a church. Let's all take part alike in the rewards that he has. Why? Because we're a community. We're a family. We're a church. We're a congregation. And we are going to do so as a team. And, that, and that's, that's the biggest thing that I see that happens is in a group like this, we start to split up. We start to get into little factions. We start to be like, oh, I'm in the, the soul winning team and I'm in the prepared dinners team and I'm in this. And you see it all the time in churches where there'll be these little small group committees. And, and some churches do it on purpose. They just break them up into little splinter cells. No, we all work together and we shall all take part alike in the rewards and the things and the blessings that God is doing. Because God wants to work through his church. He ordained that his church would be the vehicle by which, yes, he got the gospel. Out. It's also, though, his vehicle by which people are encouraged. It's his vehicle by which people are strengthened, by which people grow in Christ, receive the grace, receive fellowship, receive love. This is the purpose of it. And when we start to focus on entirely the purpose of church being just to have a big outward show and a presentation and an appearance and a look. Like, if we start to think to ourselves, hey, the most important thing about our church is that we have great music. And then all of us start taking lessons. And then we just have great symphony of music. And that's all our church is. We're failing in so many other aspects. But uh, the same thing of outward appearance. If we all just say, okay, church is all about wearing a suit. We gotta look right, we gotta, we gotta, we gotta be the best looking church ever. We gotta all be on time and show up and we're just, you know, marching in. It's, the, just this outward show, it, it's, it's fake, it's phony. But encourage one another, encourage ourselves, and do it as a community. And so much more we'll see out of this. This is a sad situation in this story. David had already been through so much, and then he loses everything. And the people that he was with are gonna throw stones at him. They're, they're feeling the same hurts he is. It's not like he's removed from it. It's not like he still has his wife. He mourned with them until he had no more strength left. He was, he was just laid out and hurt and broken just along with them. They decided that they were gonna turn against him and hurt him. Well, would that make them feel better? No. What should have happened is instead of David encouraging himself in the Lord, the people and David should have encouraged one another in the Lord. And the same steps are there, the same process. They could have sung together. They could have had that great fellowship one with another. They could have prayed together. They could have read the scriptures and stood on those promises God gave them. And when they go out from there and they want to fight, when they want to help one another, when they want to go soul winning, they're not doing it as some sort of vain show. They're doing it as a corporation. They're doing it as a conglomerate, as a group. They're doing it as a church. And there's so much more ability for God to work in that situation than he would be if it's just a few people thinking that they're carrying all the weight, they're doing all the works, they're going to receive all the glory, and nobody else is doing anything. You get that horrible attitude. you got to think that there are people at all different stages of life. And if we're doing what we are supposed to do as a church, we're going to have, we're going to have a brand new baby Christian every month. You know? We're going to have a new person that, that doesn't, doesn't know their left hand from their right hand when it comes to living the Christian life. And if we get that attitude that's going to cast stones at the leaders or is going to split ourselves up into these small groups and where are the soul winning group and, and where are the songs group and where are the, then, then that, that baby Christian is not going to grow. And we're just going to put them down. We're just going to hurt them. We're just going to run them right back out of your life because they don't meet our standard. But if as a church, hey, how you doing? Hey, uh, you know, we're going soul winning at this time. Hey, do you play a musical instrument? Hey, do you sing? Hey, do you... And we start to build one another up. Then suddenly that person that has no strength, think about it, there was, there was two-thirds that went to war, and there was one-third that didn't have the strength to do it. That means if, if they were to work as a team, they could have had two lifting one. That's not much of a burden, right? A shoulder, uh, an arm on one shoulder, an arm on another shoulder. And now you're carrying that person that doesn't have strength to you're bringing them 
I understand that the picture is, yeah, that some needed to stay by the stuff. That was needful. That was required. And David blessed them in that. But I don't think it had to be that way. I think they could have got together, manned up, picked each other up, lift each other up. And that's the picture of the church. Hey, we don't need to stand on our own and encourage ourselves in the Lord. Let's stand one with another and encourage each other in the Lord. And it will do so much more. God will get so much glory. And, and, and it'll be his work. It'll be his love through us. Why? Because some of us are stronger at something. Some of us are weaker. But if we're together, that's where the strength lies. In the ordained church of God, which Jesus Christ paid for with his blood. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for this day. I thank you for the fellowship of people that